In my past presentations, I've presented the philosophy behind the well-educated heart, which is best summed up in the words of Pestalozzi, an 18th century heart educator who said, It is for a long time the business of the heart before it is the business of the mind. Nature has reserved childhood for tending and nourishing hearts and helping create a desire for the good, the beautiful, and the true. Hearts are best fed by music, stories, pictures, and poetry. Academics are important in their place, but they're not the first concern. If you've been drawn to the philosophies of Charlotte Mason, Maria Montessori, or Rudolf Steiner, who started the Waldorf schools, a lot of what I talk about is going to feel familiar. If you haven't listened to any of my previous presentations, I encourage you to take the time to listen in the archives that you'll find posted here at the website at welleducatedheart.com. They'll help you understand more of the whys behind what I'm going to talk about today. Today I'm focusing on notebooking for the well-educated heart. A lot of you may well be doing some kind of notebooking with your kids, so let me offer a few distinguishing features of what notebooking looks like in a heart-based education. By the way, I'll be borrowing from the wisdom of Mr. Rogers, another wonderful educator of children's hearts. The question I get most often from moms is, what do I put in a notebook? My answer is that the purpose of notebooking is to help you remember and retrieve that which you want to remember and retrieve. If you have not yet found something that you want to remember, then there's no need to start a notebook. Our minds can't hold on to everything we read or hear, nor would we want to. We're bombarded with information. A secret to the art of living well is learning the art of consistently choosing that which is of greatest worth, of holding on to the kernel of wheat and letting the shaft blow away in the wind. The notebooking I'm talking about is all about digging for priceless gems and jewels, that which will nourish our hearts and our souls. Thomas Jefferson kept a commons book, and Abraham Lincoln was known to write the gems he wanted to hold on to onto a wooden slate with a piece of charcoal until he knew them by heart. From the life of Emerson, it reads, Emerson went out early to hunt a thought as a boy might hunt a butterfly, and, successful, pinned the prize in his cabinet by entering it in his thought book. I like to think of these notebooks as scrapbooking wisdom. As I've looked at other notebooking systems, I see a great emphasis on facts and information. There may have been a time when memorizing capitals of states and names of presidents was useful because people didn't have easy access to information. They had to draw upon that which was in their memories. We no longer live in that age, and we can put our attention on higher matters. I have yet to find a fact that I couldn't access instantly on my phone. What's the capital of Maine? Who was the 17th president? What year did Napoleon die? It's a modern-day technological miracle. With our explosion of instant information available to us, it makes no sense to fill my notebooking pages with trivia. I'm going for the gold. I'm going for those things Mr. Rogers taught. I want to be more concerned with a sense of wonder than with information. I want to place a higher value on those things that are not seen than those things that are seen. He taught that everything that really matters isn't found in the words on a page. They're found in the white spaces between the words, the white spaces between the lines. They are the aha moments when the light goes on and we get flashes of pure inspiration. Notebooking, as I'm about to describe, is designed for lots of white space learning. I'm all for simple. We get so overwhelmed with the number of subjects we think we have to be teaching our children. History, English, geography, science, math, grammar, spelling, writing, art, music. Juggling it all makes us feel inadequate, and the nagging doubt is, what if I forget to teach something? And so we spend hours every day trying to get information to stick, and the sad truth is, at the end of all those years, your child, by some estimations, will forget 
90 to 98 percent of what you tried so hard to teach them. There just has to be a better way to spend our time, doesn't there? This isn't a new realization. Leonardo da Vinci understood hundreds of years ago, study without desire spoils the memory, and it retains nothing it takes in. And Plato got it right hundreds of years before that. Knowledge which is acquired under compulsion obtains no hold on the mind. Unless we care about something or find a use for it, it's likely going to wash away with time. Creating a desire and use for knowledge is the task of childhood. So a vital key of notebooking for the heart is an abundance of freedom to choose and nurturing desires rather than assigning topics. Like I just said, I'm all for simple. I believe there are only two subjects that we need to be teaching our children, people and nature. The tools we're going to use to understand people are history, biography, literature, geography, cultural studies, language arts, poetry, art, and music. All of these subjects reveal human hearts and human nature. We study history not because we need to understand people of the past so much as we need them to help us understand ourselves. From all these sources, we learn about how to live abundant lives and how to get along with others who are different than ourselves, how to understand and empathize with others, how to love. We begin to learn the laws and principles upon which human happiness is based, and as we apply them, we become wise, and we become more civilized. Wisdom is of far more worth than mere knowledge. The main tool we'll use to understand nature is our eyes. Our textbooks are going to be the stars and the ocean, the rocks, plants, trees, insects, birds, and animals. As we study them, the science of nature will be revealed, or the laws upon which all the universe operates. And in time, the two subjects, people and nature, will blend together into one great whole as nature reveals lessons to human hearts that cannot be taught more effectively in any other way. Lessons like, we reap what we sow, spring always follows winter, diamonds are formed under great pressure. As we use our eyes, we begin to see the perfect and majestic order, the math by which the universe operates. Nature is God's university and brings us face to face with our Creator, wherein we begin to gain a sense of our worth in His eyes, and the effect is pure joy, which is the ultimate objective of a heart-based education. Louisa May Alcott recorded this in her notebook. I had an early run in the woods before the dew was off the grass. The moss was like velvet, and as I ran under the arch of yellow and red leaves, I sang for joy. My heart was so bright and the world so beautiful. I stopped at the end of the walk and saw the sunshine out over the wide Virginia meadows. It seemed like going through a dark life or grave into heaven beyond. A very strange and solemn feeling came over me as I stood there with no sound but the rustle of the pines. No one near me and the sun so glorious as for me alone. It seemed as if I felt God as I never did before, and I prayed in my heart that I might keep that happy sense of nearness all my life. To that entry there is a note added years later, I have, for I most sincerely think that the little girl got religion that day in the wood when dear Mother Nature led her to God. No informational textbook can teach that. This is white space learning. I'm going to make suggestions for notebooking that I'm using, but there's no reason for you to not adapt the ideas to your circumstances and personalities of your children. And if you're asking, how do I get my kids to do this? You're asking the wrong question. The right question is, do I want to do this? Because the best way to teach notebooking for the heart is to lead by example. I'm going to start with nature. A nature journal or a nature notebook is primarily drawing what your eyes see. It's that simple. 
You may say, but I can't draw, and that just isn't true. There are very few people who cannot learn to draw. But it takes time and practice, just like when you first learn to write letters. Why does drawing matter? As was said in an 1880 art textbook for children, why do we wish to learn to draw? In order to develop in us those nobler faculties which God has given for the appreciation of His works in nature. Drawing produces an exactness of thought. Drawing gives us eyes with which to see. As Charles Kingsley wrote, So it is, one man walks through the world with his eyes open, another with his eyes shut, and upon this difference depends all the superiority of knowledge which one man acquires over another. I just got home after spending several weeks with my 95-year-old mother. She is still very independent, but we are concerned about her comfort and safety, so we thought it was best to move her into an independent living facility, which has been a very emotional transition. There are so many memories tied into her home in the neighborhood. As I crawled into bed one night, I pulled out a sketch pad, and I tried to sketch the scene from her backyard from memory, and I couldn't do it. There were so many gaps in my mind, even though I've been in her backyard hundreds of times. So the next morning I went out and attempted to sketch what I saw, and I noticed details I didn't notice before. It doesn't matter that this sketch is out of proportion. What was imprinting on my mind as I did it were the orange pyracantha berries, the quakies to the side of the fence on the left, the weeping willow and the poplar at the back of the horse pasture. I hadn't before noticed the little green bird feeder on the side of the storage shed, or the pink rose bushes. I made special note of the little gate that led to the pasture and the tree behind it. Somehow in that little exercise it has left a much more vivid impression and seen on my heart because I want to remember it long after I can no longer go and physically see it with my eyes. Louis Agassi was a legendary professor of science at Harvard University, a contemporary of Charles Darwin. He was known to place a single fish scale in front of his students, leave for a couple of hours, and then come back and ask each student what he saw. Or he'd put a fish in front of them and leave them to themselves for a couple of weeks and allowed them their own discoveries. He's taught, he taught, that's how we learn about nature. We use our eyes and ask ourselves questions. Textbooks to him were not the first step in learning. I love a little book I found written in 1904 by Edward Bigelow, How Nature Should Be Taught. He said, nature study is emotional while science is intellectual. The emotion needs to come before the intellect. We need to raise children who love nature if we wish to raise scientists. And that love comes by direct contact, by spending time with her. With a little tongue-in-cheek, he offered this. Oh, no, some scientific appreciator of a mother may say, that is crude. It flavors of the Middle Ages, of the amateur, of those who love their mother from the heart. This is an age of scientific spirit, an age of the intellect rather than of the affections. Do nothing so simple as that. Learn really to know your mother, and then you can love her with solid intellectual appreciation. First, collect some pictures and drawings of all the mothers you can find. Arrange them side by side and compare your mother to them. That will add to your knowledge of the comparative merits of your mother's personal appearance. Devote a half hour at a certain time every day to the study of mothers. Draw pictures of them. Make a detailed list of color of hair, number of eyes, nostrils, ears, length of chin, height, weight, number of fingers on each hand. State the age, past history, and a hundred or more other facts. Arrange these details under a few heads, draw a bracket around each, and collocate these in line under one big brace, with the word MOTHER written in capital letters. Make a drawing of your own mother standing erect and also bending down to kiss you as you start for school in the morning. Sketch in detail her eyes, fingers, and nose. 
Write a list of nouns, adjectives, verbs, and adverbs that will apply to your own mother, and from these, compose 10 sentences each day from 10.15 to 10.45 a.m. in connection with your drawing work. And if the task is completed before the time has expired, we will fold our arms and sing about our mothers. Bear in mind that you must never really go to see your mother for the enjoyment of seeing her, nor only for the enjoyment of her loving presence, but you must learn to love her and to let her influence permeate every fiber of your life by noting with pad and pencil all possible details of her physical structure. And then he added, Too much detail, too much method, too much correlating kills a love of nature. He went on to tell of a contest where he was asked to judge the best nature journal. He received a nicely tied up bundle of beautiful nature journals. The penmanship was perfect. The pictures were drawn just so, and they all looked exactly alike. He continued, Next I picked up an unattractive letter written on the leaves of a pocket notebook. The drawing that accompanied it was crude, and the paper was soiled by finger marks. With difficulty I read it, but was fascinated as I deciphered the story of a boy's seaside investigation of the fiddler crab. He wanted to know how they lived underground, what they did, what food they ate, what kind of quarters they occupied. He made inquiries of the fishermen. No one knew. He said, I'll find out if it takes a week. He borrowed pick, shovel, and crowbar. He went to work and he found out. Then he wrote the story as he sat beside the hole that he had dug after several hours' hard work. He made the drawing after careful watching of the living object. He wrote the article on the field of battle where the weapon was a spade, the enemy a crab. I was sorry that I had not a basket full of prizes to give that boy, because he wrote his letter for the love of it, and not for a reward of which he knew nothing. That reminds me of the drawings I got on the back of a letter recently from my 11-year-old granddaughter. She loves bugs and slugs and all things nature, and recently she's been searching and collect, searching for and collecting caterpillar eggs and growing caterpillars. This is what she sent to me. Can you feel the love? When your little ones first pick up a pencil, don't be so quick to teach them to draw the letter A. Help them strengthen those fine motor skills by drawing pictures of kittens and suns and flowers. Let them learn by watching you. Pick up a book like Watch Me Draw or Draw Right Now. You'll find drawing books all start with noticing the shapes within an object. Transferring those circles and lines and line skills to letters won't be so hard at all when the time is right. Here is Nature Study in Action, by the way. Experiment with water watercolors in your nature sketching and journaling. Recreating the colors your eyes see is half the fun, and it's hard to do with pencils. This is a new field for me. I always avoided watercolor because I ended up with a big mess of colors that ran together into various shades of gray. I've been learning the secret is to make sure you buy a good quality of watercolor paper so that the water can soak into the page and not puddle on top. There are some awesome free videos online done by John Muir Laws on how to draw from nature. He also just published a book which I highly recommend. And the thing I love about him is he absolutely loves what he does. It's contagious. Do check out all the free videos online. And be sure and leave room on your pages to add poems or quotes you may come across later, like Edith Holden did in her Country Diary of an Edwardian Lady. Wouldn't that be fun sometime to do what she did? But no matter if you never get there, there are rewards all along the way in just trying. Stories add to the sense of wonder. If you've spent any time with me, you know my love for the books written in the golden age of children's literature between the years of around 1880 to 1920, which you can find on my website. The nature books of this era are a wonderful blend of heart and mind, and you will add Find so many things to add interest to your nature walks. For instance, can you draw a dandelion leaf from memory? Did you know dandelion means tooth of a lion? 
Can you now see the lion's teeth in the leaf? I bet you'll never forget that. And I was reading a story about apple blossoms. I love apple blossoms in the spring. And the writer went through what happened over the course of summer and fall when apples are produced. And where did the apple blossoms go? It's right inside the apple. I couldn't believe it. So I went and cut an apple in half myself. And sure enough, there's an imprint of an apple blossom inside. Nature is full of such surprises to spark wonder and nature journaling helps you to preserve it. I was talking with a mom in our group who told me of a young woman she knew who had decided to pursue a course of study in college that required science. She was nervous because she had never taken a formal science class before. She had just drawn in a nature journal. But the first semester she called home. Guess what, Mom? I'm doing better than anyone in my biology class because I know what these animals really look like. Now let's move over to the people side. Children are naturally curious, curious and ask a lot of questions. A question is the heart's way of saying, there's a gap in here I need to fill. And when the answer comes, the heart knows exactly where to fit it in. Even God waits for us to ask. But think what our current system of education does when a child enters school. The teacher says, I'll ask the questions around here, and you answer the questions I tell you to answer. For the next 12 plus years, a child will be given little to no choice in what he learns. His days will be assigned and structured and tested, with no regard as to whether or not he cares about what he's learning. By the time many children leave school, leave school, they've lost their desire to learn anything. I've even talked to people who have to rely upon someone else to tell them if they liked a book or a movie. They don't have the capacity to judge for themselves. You can change that. A big part of notebooking for the heart is allowing a child to connect to those feelings within. What do they like? What do they want to learn more about? You can increase those desires by offering a wide variety of stories and experiences, but allowing them the, them the freedom to say, I like that, or I don't like that. That's a vital, process, a vital part of the learning process in childhood. A very first notebooking experience for preschoolers can be to let them cut out pictures from a magazine and choose favorite things to glue into a little notebook of their very own. My daughter's been picking up some fine art books from used book sales, and she recently let her girls go through and cut out their favorite fine art masterpieces and glued them in a book. P pictures and poetry will then be the next step in our people study. A couple of summers ago, while I was helping my daughter with a new baby, her fifth little girl, I picked out a sheet of blank white paper and said to six-year-old Madison, Hey Madison, what's your favorite mother goose rhyme? She thought for a minute and said, Hey, diddle, diddle. Okay, where do you want me to write it? Right here. Her heart was getting a little writing and reading lesson while she watched me form letters and write left to right. We read it together and then she drew a picture of the cow jumping over the moon and the dish running away with a spoon. We three hole punched it and put it in a notebook. The next day, Grandma, can we do another one? Sure, which one? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Where do you want me to write it? Right here. Then she ran off to draw her picture. Four-year-old Emma had been watching. Grandma, I want to do that. Okay, what's your favorite poem? Hmm, Little Bo Peep. Same thing. Three-year-old Andy said, I want to do that. Rain, rain, go away. Nine-year-old Kaylee was watching and said, I want to do that. But she did her own writing and drawing. We didn't do it every day, but after I left, my daughter said one day Madison got a little impatient waiting for her to finish feeding the baby, so she said, that's okay, Mom, I'll just write it. Madison had been somewhat a uh, somewhat reluctant writer, but she went out and pulled out the Mother Goose book, found the picture of the poem she was looking for, and copied it. Hickory Dickory Dock. I wish I had paid closer attention at the time, but one of our daughters had a first grade teacher who taught the children to read through poetry. Each week she would read a new poem aloud, and then the children said it aloud with her. Then she would hand it out in print, 
where they read it together and illustrated the page and put it in a special notebook. Reading happens so naturally in that class. I think it's because poetry has such fantastic ordering properties for our brains and creates so many visual images, not to mention the connection to our feelings. Why do we study poetry? I loved Robin Williams' answer in Dead Poet Society. We don't read and write poetry because it's cute. We read and write poetry because we are members of the human race, and the human race is filled with passion medicine, law, business, engineering, these are noble pursuits and necessary to sustain life. But poetry, beauty, romance, love, these are what we stay alive for. I also liked this answer by Newell Dwight Hillis. The soldier fights for his native land, but the poet touches that land with a charm that makes it worth fighting for. The statesman enlarges and orders liberty in the state, but the poet fosters the love of liberty in the heart of the citizen. Nothing remains longer in the memory than simple poems learned in childhood. The best way to kill a love of poetry in the beginning is to analyze it. The best way to help your children to love poetry is to love poetry yourself and read it aloud to them. Compile an anthology of your favorite poems to share with your children, and then encourage them to build their own collection of favorites, which is the purpose of the poetry or the memory gems notebook. Those poems we love the most, we will naturally want to commit to memory. And if you're looking for some good poetry collections, you will find a lot of them and a lot of suggestions on the S2 online library. Copying and illustrating poetry pages can be part of a weekly poetry tea time where you gather with simple refreshments and share your favorites. Copying poetry is a good way to help a child practice his handwriting skills and do teach them cursive. Brain scans show that the entire brain lights up when a person writes in cursive, which doesn't happen when they print or type the words. Around age four, which is when children enter a prime age for imaginative stories, you might consider a favorite fairy tales book in preparation for the Literature Gems book, which is to come later. I wouldn't make a child draw every story you read, but here again, you can lead by example. My daughter had finished reading the story of the Frog Prince, and she said something like, I like that story, I want to remember it. So she drew a picture and added a gem. A promise is a promise. And then her girls all wanted to draw one too. You can do these on she sheets of paper and put them in a notebook or for the sake of space create a my favorite fairy tales book from a bear book and include the illustrations in one volume. If you fill it up start a new book. Here are their illustrations from A Real Princess. From time to then from time to time Sit down one-on-one -on -one and have a conversation like this. Oh, how did that story go again? And let your child retell the story or parts of the story. Verbal expression precedes written expression, and this is a natural way to help kids begin to narrate. I suggest as you find lesser-known fairy tales, you make a note on the page where you found the story. I hear moms all the time who tell me of a favorite story they've heard as a child and they've looked and looked for it and they can't find it again. And by the way, if you go to the S3 online library, you'll find a lot of fairy tales to choose from. As you start reading some of the popular children's classic literature like Treasure Island and Secret Garden, I suggest creating a literature gems notebook. I like the word gem because it's something that's small but extremely valuable, long-lasting, and it sparkles. A literature gems notebook is where you can copy the gems you mine from your reading. Here's how I would create a page. Write the title on the top of the page and underneath who the book was written by. Include where and when the story took place, and when you know it, add a one-line synopsis of the story. In the beginning, let the page mostly be pictures to remind children of the story. They can either illustrate it themselves, or you can shrink the illustrations down from the book and glue them on the page. 
I've started doing that for you for some of the more popular children's classics, and you'll find them just below the book link in the online library. I organize the book titles alphabetically in my notebook. Do you have your child make a page for every single book he reads? No, only the books that have something in them he wants to hold on to and remember. And if they read a lot of books with nothing worth holding on to, they may realize for themselves maybe there are some better choices out there for them. In the beginning, use pictures like these to help jog your child's memories as they start as they tell the story from the pictures. But the real value of this notebook is when they are able to start adding the gems they're gleaning from their reading, which they'll learn to do by watching you. When I'm reading along, I often come to something that just grabs hold of me, that sets me to thinking, something that I say to myself, I want to remember that. I use tabs like this. And then when I'm all done with the book, I go back and reevaluate. Reevaluate. Do I care about this enough to actually copy it down? If the answer is yes, it goes on my page. Sometimes if the passage is long, I just write enough to remind me and I always write the page number of the book now, down so I can find it again. Here are the kinds of gems I hold on to. This is from A Little Princess. Perhaps to be able to learn things quickly isn't everything. To be kind is worth a great deal to other people. She had not learned French exactly. Her papa loved it, and she loved it because he did. When people are insulting you, there is nothing so good for them as not to say a word, just to look at them and think. When you will not fly into a passion, people know you are stronger than they are. If nature has made you a giver, your hands are born open, and so is your heart. And though there may be times when your hands are empty, your heart is always full, and you can give things out of that. Warm things, kind things, sweet things, help and comfort and laughter, and sometimes kind laughter is the best help of all. Perhaps kind thoughts reach people somehow through windows and doors and walls. Perhaps you feel a little warm and comforted and don't know why when I'm standing here in the cold and hoping you will get well and happy again. These gem pages are never finished. When you read the book again, you may find new gems to add. Pages don't have to be illustrated. Here's a page from a lantern in her hand, and I just added a few splashes of color here and there. Here's a few, of gem, few gems from that book. You have to dream things out. It keeps a kind of an ideal before you. If you want a garden, why, I guess you've got to dream a garden. Because the road was steep and long and through a dark and lonely land, God set upon my lips a song and put a lantern in my hand. On the next page, th that is what love is to a woman, a lantern in her hand. It takes faith and courage and love and prayer and work and a little singing to keep up your spirits. Afterwards, they went out on the porch, and Abby held the little girl on her lap. She cuddled her up and put her wrinkled cheek against the child's firm one. Oh, why didn't mothers do it more when they had the chance? As these gems are copied, a lot of white space learning about writing is going on. Master artists learn to paint masterpieces by copying the masterpieces. Master writers did the same thing. They copied the writing of masterful writers. As your children copy beautiful words written by masters of writing, writing lessons are being impressed on their hearts that cannot be taught directly. As they read them aloud, they're getting the best of lessons in grammar, too. A study was done where one group was taught grammar by the typical direct worksheet approach. The other learned through literature, like I'm describing. At the end of the study, both groups had the same level of grammar comprehension, but the first group had developed a distaste for the whole subject. I'm now going to move into the notebooks that are connected to a study of history, but I want to help you visualize the kind of learning that's going to take place. Most learning I see in school and typical curriculum is linear learning. 
there's a shopping list of subjects to teach. You teach them and then you move on. If we were machines, learning like this would work perfectly. But we're not machines. Most learning in this way gets thrown away in the big pile of who cares. What I'm looking for are ways to accommodate spiral learning, which is where learning happens line upon line, layer upon layer, here a little and there a little, which is why I've created a 12-month rotation schedule. It's built around a study of American history with the major nations of the world tied into the monthly American history topics. I explained it in more detail in other places, and I don't want to take the time here to go into it, but basically, if, for instance, it's month five, which includes a study of France, I'll draw from literature written by French writers or which takes place in France, music by French composers or with a French theme, art by French artists, history, biographies, and cultural studies about France and French people. An eight-year-old may hear a very basic story of Joan of Arc, but as that child returns as a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old and even a 20-year-old, new insights and discoveries will deepen and expand his, inter his understanding of her, the circumstances around her story, and the role it played in what followed after. Learning will layer in over time, and this kind of learning could never happen in one shot. As you start to rotate through the countries, it's fun to start with the culture and create a world culture notebook. I call mine Around the World. Each child can have his or her own, but if you have a lot of kids, you may want to have a family notebook for everyone to share. I have dividers for the countries listed in the rotation schedule arranged alphabetically in the notebook. What kinds of pages go in this book? Well, if you eat some French food, take a picture of it preferably with family members. Glue it on a page and have one of your kids copy the recipes. If you make a craft, take a picture of your kids making it and enjoying it. If there's a story behind it, such as using it in connection with a holiday, let one of your children add that to the page. Or learn a game from that country. Take a picture of you playing it and write down the instructions. I keep maps in this notebook so that when you hear a story, you can find and place it on the map as you go. Map work without stories is easily forgotten, but with stories you remember it easily. As you learn about interesting places to visit, print out a picture of the place paste, and paste it on a page called Places We'd Like to Visit Someday. Let a child tell reasons why it would be interesting to go there, what happened there, and what's something interesting that you'll want to look for when you are there. By the age of around eight, a child is often an independent reader, and it's time to put some reading logs in place. I call my reading log notebook, Books, 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 because I'm using the 12-month rotation schedule. I've got 12 numbered tabs, and then I have a tab for nature where I have separate pages for books about birds, flowers, stars, stars and so forth. And I have an open miscellaneous page for books that don't fit anywhere else. I have one page in each month for books pertaining to American history, which are labeled with an F, which stands for Freedom Series, or World History labeled with a W. So month one reading log in the 12-month rotation schedule is labeled F1. When I read a book, I write the title of the book and the author, and then there's a place to write page numbers I read if the entire book wasn't read. In the left-hand column, just below the number, I make a note of where I found the book. If it was found in one of the online libraries, I jot down which one. If I own a hard copy, I write O for own, and if I got it from the library, I put an L. One thing I do is use a shorthand method for finding books again, and when I make when I make entries in my Story of the World notebook that's coming up so that I don't have to keep rewriting the entire title and author out over and over again. If the book is found on this page, I'll write F1. Then I put the number of the book on that page in parentheses. This was the fifth book listed on that page. A dash comes next and following the dash is the page number of that book where I found the story or the quote. These reading log pages can be found on the resource page at the website. Now let's look at the Story of the World notebook. Two things are going into this notebook. 
real people and events. The way I'm going to start to grow this notebook is by creating what I call landing pages and it doesn't matter where you start. I call it a landing page because over the years I'm going to be drawing from a lot of different resources. Maybe I'll hear of an anecdote or an interesting piece of information about someone or a quote or a story that I want to remember and I need a place for it to land. When you create a page it's not intended for you to finish it in one sitting. It's a very open-ended project. And if you should fill up a page, just start another one. If you fill up a notebook, start another one. Here's how I create a landing page. I write the name of the person at the top of the page. I like to use color. Then I either go to Wikipedia or I simply ask my phone when that person was born. I put the year in the upper right-hand corner. I'm going to organize the book chronologically according to birth year, so it's important that I see that easily. Underneath, I'll write the year that the person died. Then I write the country where that person was born, and if he or she was primarily connected with a different country in later life, I'll make a note of that. Then I check with Wikipedia, and I write a brief statement of what that person was noted for, if I don't already know it. That's it. I've created a landing page. For children, even this much begins to make names familiar. If I have pictures, or pic even just one picture, I'll glue them on the page, leaving room for writing around them. I cut out pictures from old textbooks and organize them in a little file that looks like this. Or I shrink down fine art images and use those. You can find lots of options organized in the fine art section on our resource page. Or I've started reducing the size of illustrations from the old books and I'm posting those in the Story Club page if you want to print those out and use those pictures. I love the old pictures because they tell stories. Here are some of my landing pages. And as I flip through the book, my heart starts noticing who lived around the same time and what order things happened. It's like a timeline in a book. The pictures help provide instant recall. Pictures are worth thousands of words. I'm not going to fill these pages with facts and trivia. I'm looking for wisdom and stories and quotes and ideas and questions I want to answer. Just like in the Literature Gems book, I don't have to copy entire passages. I just need enough so that I can retrieve it again. One thing I'll mention here, if you rely on recent books, you may not find a lot of gems. That's because recent historical books have become very informational or purely entertaining. But there's not much there for inspiring hearts. Turn to the older books and you will find gems all over the place. You'll find a lot of old books, of course, that you can read for free on my website. A young child can start landing pages by drawing his or her own pictures. Here are some pictures, some pages that my granddaughters did, uh, they made after they heard the story of Balboa. It's interesting how they all had the same impression from the story they were read, that he was a mean man. In a few years, they'll hopefully revisit him with another point of view as part of the spiral learning. I just finished a book, The Honor of Balboa, and this is what this book said about him. Unlike many of his ruthless compatriots, Balboa could not bring himself to senselessly slaughter and brutally enslave the native population. This humanitarian instinct was both his greatest source of strength and his fatal weakness. Was he mean or wasn't he? This is the makings of critical thinking skills. Research has proven that trying to direct, directly teach critical thinking doesn't work. What does work is immersing young people in rich content where they bump into conflicting information and they have to learn to sort it out. It takes time and experience, but we do them no favors by constantly only feeding them what we think is the correct story. Encourage them to read widely and always to be open to learning new things. Truth has a way of working its way to the top. I like to create landing pages for my own ancestors and place them in the story of the world. Here's my page for my Grandma Johnson from Sweden. She was a woman of incredible patience. And that was the gem I put there. 
The other kind of page that goes in here is an events page, but I don't have nearly as many of them. I look for key events such as the landing of the Mayflower or the Civil War. If I think it's very significant, I'll create it on a divider tab like this. You'll notice there aren't a lot of have-tos in this because you want to allow your children to create notebooks that are meaningful to them. As they become familiar with the lives of history, maybe they'd like to create a special book of personal heroes where they tell the stories of some of their favorites. What a great writing activity! In the beginning, have them dictate the story to you or encourage them to create individual books of the lives they found the most interesting using bear books their own story of Joan of Arc, for example. As they read a variety of books reflecting different points of view, you'll recognize the beginnings of research skills, and these books they create can become real keepsakes. So much better than being assigned a report. When I visit my grandchildren, they run to bring me their books and show me what they've been learning. Later, when they begin a formal study of history, the names will have personalities and the men and women of history will come to life, even becoming teachers, mentors, and friends to your children. And to you. For instance, a couple of weeks ago, for some reason my website started acting squirrely and I couldn't publish new content. We contacted support and the more they worked on it, the worse it got. Chunks of the website started disappearing until it was completely gone. Several days later, we were told that it looked like a lower-level support person had accidentally deleted all our content and there was apparently no backup. I was devastated. I had spent hundreds, if not thousands, of hours over several years putting together the content. There were over 3,000 books I had personally hunted for, selected, and reviewed, organized, and linked. I had found many of them in obscure, roundabout ways, and I didn't think I could ever find them again. And there were hundreds of other links to music and other resources that would have been impossible to duplicate. It. duplicate. I couldn't imagine starting over again. I was heartsick, and yes, tears were involved and I found myself thinking of just walking away from it all. It was too overwhelming to begin again. In the middle of my pity party, Thomas Carlyle stepped into a room in my heart and pulled up a chair. Oh, Marlene, he said, I know how you feel. He had spent months of hard labor and painstaking research on a book about the French Revolution. He and his wife were destitute, and they were counting on the sale of the book to pay some way overdue bills. He gave his only manuscript to a friend to look it over before sending it off to a publisher. When he didn't hear from his friend for quite some time, he stopped by his house only to discover the housekeeper thought the manuscript was rubbish and had been using it to light the fire. It was gone, and Carlyle had already destroyed his notes. Sir Isaac Newton got wind of our conversation and stopped by too. Ah, yes, he said, I remember. He had stacks of paper on his desk, containing years of observation and data. His favorite little dog accidentally knocked over his lamp, and the papers went up in flames. Then John Audubon pulled up a chair, shaking his head in sympathy. He had spent years tramping out in the wilds in search of rare and unusual birds and had painted detailed drawings of them. He had over two hundred of them. He had to travel east for a time, but when he got home to Kentucky, he found the rats had eaten them all. And then a new friend of mine stopped by, a rice and sweat Martin. I knew what a hard life he'd had. As he overcame his challenges, he wanted to help other people who were discouraged and down on their luck. So he had spent years gathering stories and anecdotes to compile into a book. One night as he stayed in a hotel with his papers that he had put together, someone yelled fire. He made it outside with just the clothes on his back. But all his hard work went up in flames. They understood what I was feeling all right. And then, one by one, they reminded me how they picked themselves up out of their depression and began again. This time, Carlyle, Carlyle wrote straight from his heart. 
Critics say no one has ever brought the French Revolution to life as Carlyle did. The book has never been out of print since the day it was published, and it even inspired Dickens to write his tale of two cities. After weeks of deep depression, Audubon determined he would begin again, and this time make his drawings even better. No one has brought the bird world up close and personal like Audubon. Marden, too, began collecting news stories. It was said that Marden, a hundred years ago, was personally responsible for inspiring millions of people around the world who were down on their luck to pick themselves up and try again. William Bradford, leader of the Mayflower Pilgrims, was a little late to the conversation, but he stopped by to remind me, Marlene, all great and honorable actions are accompanied with great difficulties and must be overcome with answerable courage. When half of the hundred and six, hundred and two pilgrims lost their lives that first winter, with most of the survivors among the thirty-nine children, it took great courage to turn down the Mayflower captain who offered to take them home to England. Thank goodness for us they stayed. My friends from history lifted me up and encouraged me to start again if I had to, and before they left, I promised them I would. Fortunately, I had a much easier outcome than they had. A few days later, someone higher up in the support chain was able to get to the bottom of the problem and restore everything. But I thought to myself, this is the blessing of studying the lives of the men and women of history. No matter what you are facing, no matter what your children will face, there is someone from the pages of history or from the pages of literature to show the way through, the child or grown-up whose reservoir of stories is broad and deep will more likely possess a heart that will not fail. Facts alone cannot do that. A mom in our group said her 14-year-old son had a copy of his Story of the World notebook in his hands one day, and looking at it, he said, if people knew what was inside of this, they would know this is a priceless treasure. And so it is. Which brings me to the final notebook and probably the most important one. The Alcott children were encouraged to keep diaries from the time they were little in which they wrote down their thoughts and feelings and fancies. Louisa called hers her heart journal. My experience I just shared will go into my heart journal, as well as other times I find my life influenced by my friends from history and literature. But that's not all. A rice and sweat Martin wrote, Where do writers find all those interesting things they write about? They find them because they are always on the lookout for them. Just think how many curious, interesting things you have forgotten or lost in your life simply because you did not make them permanently yours by taking the pains to jot them down. Even if you never become a writer, the notebook habit would enrich your life wonderfully and make you a much fuller, a more complete, more worthwhile man or woman. In a different book, Marden wrote of a certain aged woman who always had an air of serenity about her and was approached by a woman who was weighed down with life's troubles and cares and wanted to know her secret of calm. The aged woman replied, I keep a pleasure book. Long ago I learned there is no day so dark and gloomy that it does not contain some ray of light, and I have made it one business of my life to write down the little things which mean so much to a woman. I have a book marked for every day, for every year since I left school. It's but a little thing. The new gown, the chat with a friend, the thoughtfulness of my husband, a flower, a book, a walk in the field, a letter, a concert, or a drive. But it all goes into my pleasure book, and when I am inclined to fret, I read but a few pages to see what a happy, blessed woman I am. You may see my treasure if you will. The fretful woman glanced through it, even noticing the entry, He died with his hand in mine, and my name upon his lips. Laced throughout were bits of verses and lines from her daily reading, making its page a storehouse of truth and beauty. He gets the most out of life, who realizes the latent treasures invisible to most eyes, 
who sees beauties and grace where others see only ugliness, deformity. What a simple but far-reaching habit to sit down with a young child at the end of each day and jot down even one small thing that brought him or her joy that day in the beginnings of that child's heart journal. By such a simple means, great lives are formed. I want to now just review the things that I've talked about in this presentation, and you can find this also on the resources page at theWellEducatedHeart.com. For your preschoolers, start by helping them make notebooks with pictures of favorite things. Teach them to draw before you teach them to form letters. Draw from nature whenever possible. Be sure your preschoolers get to watch you. Around age four, start poetry books, beginning with Mother Goose Rhymes in preparation for creating anthologies of favorite poetry. At five, create favorite fairy tale books in preparation for creating notebooks for literature gems. By six or seven, include children in a world cultures notebook, either personal or family, with maps, recipes, holiday celebrations, games, and places you hope to visit. By eight, set up reading logs and story of the world notebooks with landing pages for people and events. Finally, encourage the keeping of a heart journal. If you live in a school district that, pro that requires proof of subjects taught, your literature gems and heart journal reflects a correct usage of grammar, spelling, writing, and a study of literature. Your world cultures notebook and story of the world reflects the study of geography, social science, and history, as well as art and music, critical thinking, and research skills. Your nature journals demonstrates a study of scientific topics and the reading log offers proof of material studied. I guarantee it will far exceed the number of books read in a traditional classroom. There are many, many free resources for you to use to accomplish all the things I've been talking about at thewelleducatedheart.com. It may feel overwhelming when you first get there, and even moms who have been using our site for a while will say to me, I had no idea that was there. So to help orient you to all you'll have to work with, I've recently created a Catch the Vision introductory course that will walk you through everything on our site, and in the process of going through it, you'll have an opportunity to set up each of your notebooks. If you go to our training page, which is the Start Here option in the menu bar at the top, and scroll down just below the picture of the ducks, you'll see it. It's number two. Just print out the course, which includes reading logs and maps and story guides, everything you'll need to do what I've been talking about. And it's free. For now, I'll end with this poem from a 13th century Persian poetry. If of thy mortal goods thou art bereft, and from thy slender stores two loaves alone to thee are left, sell one, and from the dole buy hyacinths to feed the soul. As you notebook for your heart, may you and your children find many hyacinths to feed your souls. <laughs>